A reading from Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear, to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, and who will declare me guilty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. All my life is wasted with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I am the scorn of all my enemies, a disgrace to my neighbors, a dismay to my acquaintances. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. Like the dead, I am forgotten out of mind. I am as useless as a broken heart. Into your hands, O oh Lord, I commend my spirit. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd, fear is all around. They put their heads together against me, they plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Into your hands, O oh Lord, I commend my spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to St. Mark Glory, Glory to you, Lord. As soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. They began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothing among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And some ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that it was this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and Joseph, and Salome. 
These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who, also, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body had been laid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel of Mark, I'm sure I've mentioned, likes to do something uh, that we, we being academics, have named, nicknamed, the Markin Sandwich. The Mark and Sandwich is when Mark takes a story, splits that story in half, and then puts other stories in the middle of that story. Uh, I also happen to be in the, in the group of people who believe that the gospel is one giant sandwich, kind of, kind of like the, a, a gospel club sandwich of stories that has several stories crammed into the midst of one large split. That split, I believe, begins with the opening line of the Gospel of Mark, which says, This is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It seems simple, but you've probably heard me say before that's a loaded statement, because it is at least borrowing, if not mocking, an announcement from the emperor. See, Caesar Augustus had had a birthday, and uh, it is the emperor who gets to announce good news. And so a decree had gone out from Emperor Augustus. I'm beginning to sound like Luke right now, I know. But uh, a, a, degree, a decree had gone out uh, that said, this is the good news, the gospel of Caesar Augustus, the son of God the Prince of Peace, Savior, Lord of Lords, maybe some other comments like that. But things we would not typically, as Christians, associate with an emperor, but instead with Jesus, those have been made regarding this emperor. And so Mark seems to be saying that that's not true. The emperor does not get to announce good news. It's this person, Jesus, so this is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then throughout the rest of the story, there are all these examples of who Jesus is and why he matters. And throughout all of those, there are these moments when the disciples sort of get who he is. There is a moment very early at the beginning, a, a group of unclean spirits who recognize who Jesus is. They know exactly who he is. They're the first entity in Mark's narrative to say out loud in the story what the narrator told us at the beginning. We know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth, son of God. And he tells them, be quiet. Later, uh, again, uh, over and over, but one particular story that we heard uh, Peter begins to get it. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Messiah. And Jesus, as he does many times in the Gospel of Mark, says, don't tell anyone. It's a strange thing that Jesus seems to do as he displays his power and who he is, and, and people begin to figure out 
who he might be, he keeps telling them, don't tell anybody. And you've heard me joke over and over, it's the one commandment from Jesus that Lutherans can follow. Don't tell anyone. But over and over, don't tell anyone. Why? Because they don't get it completely. Jesus knows the inevitable end that he will face. Jesus and his ministry understands that he's going up against those in religious authority and those in political authority. And that because, as, as too often happens, that religious authority has decided to side with political authority, and in part is they do that because they don't make that strong division between those things like we do now. That's beside the point. But that too often, religious authority, and the, the church is very much included in this, and makes up a big chunk of the church's history, has sided with those in power to try to maintain a status quo. It's going on in our country right now. And that Jesus sees that his kind of ministry, the way he sees the world, the calling that he has as God among us, will lead him into conflict with those in power. And it will kill him. He tells the disciples this over and over, and again, it's Peter, poor guy. It's Peter who speaks up and says, no, Lord, it's not going to happen that way. And that's when Jesus has to say, get behind me, Satan. So nobody gets it. Mark understands it's impossible to get it. Until we come to the story that we just heard. And here's the last half of this enormous Markan sandwich. It is there after he's been derided for religious and political reasons, that he's been crucified by the power of the empire to get him out of the way. Standing at the foot of the cross, the first human being in Mark's narrative is able to say out loud, what we heard from the narrator at the beginning. Surely this man was God's son. Everything in between is to explain this story. Jesus is the son of God. So why is the story told to us? There are many reasons. But one is so that we can see what we have been told about this person, Jesus. Not just an example, but as the very presence of God in our life to empower us to be disciples because it's only after his death on the cross that Mark tells us about a group of women who were there. Because Mark understands that again, it's only through the lens of the cross we will understand who they are and how they embody God's call for us. A group of women who had followed Jesus in his ministry and had served him, who had deaconed with him, is really what the Greek is saying. Who had embodied Jesus' own ministry, who himself had said, I have not come to be served, but to serve. And these women were disciples who served. They are us. They are who we are called to be. In the light of this story of who Jesus is and why he matters. To be set free from the need to pursue power. To be set free from the way that the world wants us to see itself and how it works, but to instead see the world the way that these women did. Who saw the world the way that Jesus did. Who had already been performing Jesus' ministry and now empowered to perform it in a new way. As Mark's story continues, the role of women will continue to be important 
give you a hint, maybe even scary. But we will face that when we come to Easter. But definitely what they are. An invitation and an example of discipleship and holy living for us as people who stand after the cross, encountering who Jesus is, and being given new life to share with those around us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.